All right, guys, welcome back to part three of building the Warhammer 40K Forge World Valdor Tank Hunter. When we last left off, we had finished up all the painting on our gun. The weathering that we're going to do for the most part, we painted the interior area where the gun sits in the cradle, and we put our hull together. So now we're going to start preparing the entire thing for its paint job, starting with wrapping this gun up so that as we apply paint, we're not ruining all the, the good work we did. Now, some people might just say, you know, let, let's just slap, I don't know, masking tape on it or something. That's a way to do it, but it's not the way I want to do it. I want to use something that is uh, guaranteed not to pull any paint or any of the detailing off that we already did. So this is just regular packing paper, and this is what I'm going to use around the gun. This came in a, a box of some stuff I ordered, and free material uh, works really well, and it will protect the gun just fine without making it so that we, you know, have to mess with tape and all that other stuff later. We're still going to tape it down a little bit, but we're not going to get any kind of tape or anything on the gun itself, which means we're not worried about pulling off our paint or, or stuff like that. Okay. This is why we did a lot of the painting on the interior ahead of time. We can raise the gun to do a little bit near the end if we need to, but it works out very nicely this way. So. Alright. Now remember, the idea is to mask, but also make it easy to pull the masking off because when it's all finished, we are going to have pieces surrounding this main gun. So, that's part of the challenge here, is making it so we don't have a crazy puzzle to unmask later. Now that we've got the masking of the gun done, uh, this guy right here gave me a lot of problems. Uh, <laughs> I had to sand this quite a bit to make sure we had a secure flush fit with the hull and to get these hoses into these connectors to the capacitors. I ended up having to uh, sand a lot more than I originally thought I was, I was going to have to. I also used a Dremel to si sort of drill this out a little bit because beneath this goes this heat shield and there was at, like no clearance whatsoever for the heat shield at all. So that was, that was an issue. So it ends up going together like this. Uh, you know, it's going to take a little bit of work to fit it all in and I'm not going to do that uh, right away. I'm going to want to get some painting done first. So with that properly masked off now, we can get our pieces ready for our first coat of paint, which is actually going to be black primer across the entire thing. Scratch that thought. One more thing we need to do. Um, I'm going to mount the magnetized gun options into this little uh, side turret there. Now, uh, I contemplated um, attaching a weapon first. Originally, I said I, I was going to magnetize them all. I still might, but I, I don't see myself using much besides the heavy flamer there. But if you take a look at the casting, um, you know, we talked about in the beginning of this, sometimes you can get great detail. Sometimes, depending on where the cast is in the casting cycle, you have problems. There's a lot of cleanup work that needs to take place with these weapons before they're ready for mounting. There's a very bad mismatch there. Um, I doubt I'm actually going to use the the stubber there. Um, I might use the Lazcan and I might use the bolter, I'm not sure. With the heavy stubber mounted, um, that was a little chore to, to trim up and everything, but it's on there, so we don't have to worry about it. Something else I'd like to do before I paint is just take a couple track pieces and put them in position so that we can install the track guards prior to painting, because getting those track pieces in because of the curve here would be kind of hard. So. While I'm going to paint the majority of the tracks still on the sprue, uh, I'm going to put these pieces in just so that we can get the track guards on. It makes life a little bit easier with the painting process. Um, now, are these, should these be two track links? You know, again, like I said in one of the other episodes, one of the problems with 
a Forge World kit like this is that the instructions aren't always great. And quite frankly, you know, I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't give instructions, but we'll have to work on it as we go. Now putting the the two link in there lets us put the the track guard on and it also gives us room to wrap more pieces around. So I think that's probably how they intended it to go. Um, we'll just go with it for now and if it's a disaster later, it's a disaster later. But I want to be able to get these track guards on so that we can paint as one piece. Um, got to do a little fitting. See, they're actually kind of pulling off the pieces here. Let me make sure that this glue has proper time to set. Lots of dry fitting is the way we want to do this since we're using a super glue to put it together. So once it's glued, there won't be a lot of options in fixing it. There are some aftermarket very fine applicators that you can get for putting on super glue, and I have one. I've just never actually used it. But it is a, uh, it's an interesting little device. I'll show you. It's this uh, little metal, almost looks like a needle. And you can dip it in super glue and it holds a little bit right there and you can place it in hard to reach areas. Sometimes uh, I think about using it and I never do. Um, for the most part, I just work with these small tubes so I can keep really good control of it. And that's worked just fine for me so far. Okay, so we got our track guards on. This one's a little bit crooked, but I'm not too worried about it. Just like one of the trench rails is a little bit crooked, but I'm really not worried about it because I'm going to do some weathering before we paint as well to show some damage to the vehicle. Seeing as how this would be an older vehicle in service of the Emperor. And so it, it might have a little bit of years in use on it. Now the way that we're going to do some of that combat weathering is, is very easy. We're going to use uh, snippers, we're going to use a hobby knife, we'll use a drill bit from time to time. This is a great position right here, maybe a shot has hit and done a little bit of damage, not really penetrated the armor or anything. Um, so I will start by just drilling a small hole, and it doesn't need to be very deep, because if it was, probably would have damaged the tank. And from that hole, all we do is we kind of cut out a little bit of damage in a not quite a star pattern. Remember, you don't want it to be a pattern, but in a way that shows that there's chips around where the round went in an actual damage, not just a perfectly round hole, but you know, you want to be able to show this off. Now in some pictures of old armored uh, vehicle hits, you'll see just a hole. But what we've got here is a little bit of a star pattern there showing the uh, armor plating chipping when it was hit. And just remember that you can always take off a little bit more if you want, but you can never ever put back on, you know, without filling the whole thing with putty and everything once you've taken some off. So that's one type of damage to do. I might do one more shot right there at a slightly different angle um, as it was moving. Remember, don't go too deep with these because otherwise it would have penetrated the vehicle and, and done more damage than just plating and stuff. And I did a lot of this work. You've already seen it. Um, when I converted a, uh, a Bane Blade to a Storm Blade. I did the same kind of weathering. Now, I'm, I'm sort of doing the same exact pattern here. We don't want to do that because that's not very random. So I'm going to change it up just a little bit. Make it a little bit different looking. Uh, if you get in the habit of, of doing kind of the same stuff, don't let yourself do that. Catch yourself and, and make it look a little bit different. There we go. Now, how much you weather it obviously is up to you. That's one of the things that I've always said I love about Warhammer. It's your army. You can do what you want. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of chipping right there uh, in this 
piece of the hull like there was some damage. Uh, I'm going to go all around the tank and I'm just going to like, you know, think about where it might come in contact with things where damage might happen. And that's kind of where you want to affect your broken pieces. Um, and then we can highlight them later with some painting and everything. Uh, damage happens in different, different ways, different shapes. Um, a good way to show an old damaged tank is just to carve a little nick out right there and then paint it an underlying metal color um, as the tank is, you know, as it's going along. I like to remind people that a vehicle like this is always facing the enemy. So if the enemy is shooting, unless it's running away, it should come relatively frontal. Now, of course, if you just want to dress this up with lots of damage, you know, and make it look fancy, do it again, do whatever you want. I am going to... Uh, put a little tiny bit of a hole here just to start it and that way I can do one that would hit kind of the right angle that is a little difficult to move the knife around in there but you don't really have to do a lot of damage to make a really good effect this way just a few little pieces chipped here and there. Kind of tells the story for you. And works really, really well, especially, you know, after it's painted and it looks really good. Um, another thing you can do is take your snippers and just take a little, little bite out of the front of the track guard. tweezers to get that out there we go a little broken piece of metal here maybe another little cablamo right there um, so you know with your vehicle go nuts make it look as as battle wounded as you want or so I have some tanks that look completely fresh to the fight I have some that look like they've been through a living hell um, I'm gonna make this one look a little bit beat up because that's the way I like to do it um, not every hole will be as deep as others some will be very shallow some will be deep but I'm gonna continue to damage this up and get ready for painting I am ready to start painting I took the time to um, just clean up these weapons a little bit so we might as well just knock it out as we're going so I've got everything here ready to go um, I'm gonna start with uh, Alclad gloss black base which I like to use for all sorts of projects it's a great primer it's a great gloss black if that's what you need and it works really, really well for me in a, a number of situations. So, I'm gonna load up the airbrush. I'm gonna get set and ready to spray, and we will get our primer coat on so we can start painting. One thing that's going to get a totally different color than everything else is going to be this heat shield that goes on top of the gun. I decided just to make it stand out a little bit, I'm going to paint it in pale burnt metal from Alclad. 
This is the same color that I would use for a lot of uh, exhaust nozzles and, and such for aircraft models. So I figure it'll be a nice, um, a nice touch. Just throw that on there, give one more contrast in color, and then we can always um, put a little hot metal blue on top um, or some other stuff, you know, depending on how we're feeling. So we've got a very nice piece here. I like the color and everything. Um, we're going to touch up a little hot metal blue, though, just to accentuate some of that heating effect. I don't know how much heat this la a neutron laser gives off, but um, we'll pretend it's a lot. I think that's a nice little effect. Uh, what I'd like to do is just spray a little bit of clear red right over the top of it to kind of purple it up a little bit. Um, although I still want this effect to stay subtle, so I might just put it just over the the very top great parts right there. What I'm going to use is this uh, candy ink from Green Stuff World. It's pretty good to spray right out of here. We can also brush it on, but it'll give just that little bit of a purplish hue. Now we have a really nice heated effect. We've got the purple into the blue. Um, looks like something that's just been heated over time, going into that amber color. So I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. Short little, short little piece to do. I'm gonna give the inside a little bit of magenta spray. This will look real nice though. It's just sort of a little detail element, just kind of sitting there on top of the gun once it's once it's all finished. We're gonna use some plain old gun metal for the tracks, and then I'm just gonna spray the edges just a little bit here. I use this gun metal um, not only because it sprays great and it's just a good metallic color, but I have plenty of it if I need to um, brush any touch-ups or anything on the tracks and also to brush those tracks that are molded in to the vehicle. So we'll put this aside for a little bit and we will now move on to the primary color, which we talked about earlier is going to be uh, somber gray as the, the main dark gray color that goes on. I'm going to paint this similar to how I paint an aircraft model using uh, different lines. Um, it doesn't quite have panel lines the way an airplane does, but I can use uh, different features on it to, um, you know, for, to mark off shading areas and things like that with the airbrush. That'll give us the nice pre-weathering. That'll give the, you know, the, give us some, some lines and everything separating uh, portions of it, but also help out in the weathering process as we get going moving forward. finished result of our first layer of somber gray and I like it it's gonna help with the weathering and the aging of the tank and gives us a lot more going on than just a, a flat gray surface all over the place so um, you can kind of get to imagine what it's all gonna look like 
when it's done. Um, if we kind of put that in place, we kind of put that in place. Um, yeah, I'm digging it. So I'm going to let this paint cure for a while before we start masking over it to do our camouflage in our other lighter grays. Given this several hours to um, just sit and relax and do its thing, give it a nice little massage, said kind nurturing things about it, uh, we are ready now to put on our, our camouflage color. So we're going to be using Stonewall Gray and Wolf Gray. Uh, the Wolf Gray is just a bit lighter. Uh, you know, for my normal camouflage where it's just two colors, I could use either of these. They both go well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the main jagged pattern in the Stonewall Gray and then give it some accents with the Wolf Gray. So in order to do that, I'm going to need to cut some masks out of masking tape. Imagine that. Um, and get things ready and you'll, you'll see how the whole process goes. did not take too long and we have a camouflage on there that I like. I, I would have liked if I had done the mid gray a little farther back but um, I like this. I think it looks good and it'll look better once we get everything glossed and, and weathered up and, and all that. Uh, I didn't do anything here on purpose because I, I might put some some design there, some decal work. Um, I didn't, you know, I wanted this to look like they, it's a camouflage pattern that they applied in the field so it's supposed to look imperfect. Um, you know, just breaks up the lines of the vehicle, but it, it works. So now we've got a lot of little detail painting, little bits here and there before we can do our gloss coat. So I'm going to start grabbing my little brushes and picking out all the little details all over this thing. <laughs> 